Hello, welcome to Waterpark Distributed Patient Actors versus the Pandemic. My name is Brian Hunter. It's a joy to be here today to talk about some of my team's research. So we've been off on this journey, uh, this research journey, which led to a product with an unusual architecture that's out doing good in the world. <clears throat> so I'm an enterprise fellow at HCA Healthcare, and HCA is big. So HCA owns and operates 186 hospitals, around 2,000 surgery centers, freestanding ERs, and clinics. I have 275,000 colleagues out there that can send me emails. Uh, with 32 million patient encounters each year, a lot of people truly depend on us getting things right. And so that begins um, in 2017, was presented with this research challenge uh, where within the integration, enterprise integration team. And the challenge was, given all the data and the Erlang VM, what good could we do? Could we improve patient outcomes? Could we help our caregivers, our nurses, our doctors? Could we give our hospitals a better footing in the event of disasters or a pandemic? So secondarily, we had this idea that we wanted to be able to bring some joy to IT. And so for me, dev joy is when you can be productive and when you have low friction ways to do important work. Biz joy is about faster delivery times and lowering risk and uncertainty in projects. And for ops, if you have observable fault tolerant systems with stress-free failure models, that's gonna provide some ops joy. And so we worked hard at all these. <clears throat> so the years experimentation proofs and research they seeded, they seeded several projects, and one of those is Project Waterpark. So to help patients and caregivers and all of our IT friends, one of the things we had to do is we had to be highly available. And so highly available is subjective, and so we went with the more objective number and said we have to be continuously available. We can never go down, and that was an initial goal. We wanted to make it really easy for teams around the company to push data to Waterpark and subscribe to data from Waterpark and whatever tools they came to to discourage data hoarding, make it easier to, to go to the right place instead of doing the wrong thing. And then we also, we wanted to create a place where experiments could happen, where we could have these fast, cheap, low-risk uh, uh, ground for experiments. And we also wanted to shine. We wanted to provide an example in the company of how software could be built. And so that was this, uh, this, these particular goals within Waterpark. So let's get a view of what Waterpark is. So we run on a cluster of servers. Data comes in. And some data, we just route straight back out. And other data, we transform, we map reduce, or we change. And then other, data, uh, other bits of data, other signals, are generated entirely within Waterpark. So off of all these uh, disparate streams of data, we infer meaning and we create new signals that come out of Waterpark. So Waterpark, it also it plays a lot of bases. And so we see here integration engine. We're an integration engine. We're a streaming system, a distributed database, a content delivery network, a cache, a queue, a complex event processor, and a function as a service platform. So by implementing from scratch in Elixir the, minimum set, the minimal set of features that we needed from, say, a cache or a queue meant we didn't have to take hard dependencies on those things. And so Waterpark doesn't use a distributed database like React or Cassandra. It is a database, a distributed RAM-based RAM database. And so investing a few months in building tailor-fit subsets of the features that we truly needed to do things let us avoid dependencies. And dependencies, even if they're free, aren't really free. So our deployment and failure models are now our own. We don't have to take on properties of other systems. And that has let us be zero downtime since we went to production 18 months ago. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, as uh, virtuous as wheel reinvention can be, uh, we have the Carl Sagan here, um, you have to decide if you're inventing a wheel, reinventing a wheel, or if you're reinventing the universe. And it's important to distinguish the two. So we decided uh, with our stack here, we weren't going to go off and smelt ore and make new chips and build our own hardware. We said, nope. And so we went with commodity one-use servers. 
Uh, we tried to pick servers that were easy to get and also that would fail as a unit. So they don't have shared storage or any fancy features in them. These are just boxes with drives, one U, so that they fail as a unit and other things don't cause them to fail. And, and all of our failures contained within that one piece of steel. And we didn't write a language or an operating system either. We did choose a less conventional operating system. We chose the Erlang VM. And so on a single commodity server, we run millions of actor processes, massive concurrency out here. And these processes, the actor processes, they auto balance across the cores on the server. And we get soft real time without doing anything special. We don't really think about this. It just comes as part of this operating system that we're using, the Erlang VM. And there's no such thing in our world as memory locks or threads. I think it's maybe a story that other language developers uh, use to scare children or something, but, uh, but we don't have that. And so talking to an actor running in Waterpark or running in, on the Erlang VM, uh, it doesn't matter. It's as simple to talk to one locally uh, across the cluster as it is one locally, and there's just no difference here. And so all of those special purpose things that came in, the Erlang VM is a special purpose operating system, and its special purpose is around fault tolerance, concurrency, and distribution, and the actor model, and it fit our needs. So the actor model, let's take a quick peek at it. Uh, so it was introduced by Carl Hewitt and crew back in 73, and it's a model of concurrent computation inspired by physics. In the model, actors are this fundamental element, and when actors receive messages, they can make local changes, they can create more actors, they can send messages, or they can figure out what they're gonna, how they're going to respond to the next message that comes in. We'll see a bit about that with a universal server that we'll talk about later. So it would be a good idea for us to take a quick primer. I'm going to try to keep this short uh, about what the Erlang VM is so that it doesn't feel like a bunch of magic that I'm talking about later. So every actor in the Erlang VM, this operating system, has some props. And so we have memory. and each actor has its own dedicated, isolated block of memory. And it starts off tiny, two kilobytes on a 64-bit machine. And inside of that, we have a stack and a heap. And as our actors, as they run and they grow and they accumulate state, uh, the state, the memory grows following the Fibonacci series. And when that memory is no longer needed, well, we have a garbage collector. And so each individual process that's running, so again, hundreds of thousands of these things running on a server, each one of them gets their own isolated, dedicated garbage collector. Now let that think, sink in for just a second to think about what we have here. We have this, this language, or this platform, this operating system that only runs functional programming languages. All these languages take immutability seriously. You can't mutate state. The process is you can't share memory. You can't touch memory from another process. You're the only one that's ever touched it. And <laughs> So this is not a bad place to be a garbage collector. It's the easiest GC job in the world to be an Erlang garbage collector. And out of this, we get these soft, real-time, tiny, deterministic GCs here. Um, you don't have the stop the world GCs like you would have on some other platforms. Each actor also gets a mailbox. And this is the only way that a process can talk to other things in uh, other actors or even to the environment. File I.O. is actually done through talking through the mailbox. You can't do anything other than talk through the mailbox in Erlang or in Elixir. And so it's lonely being a process or being an actor. And so, and this final box here links and monitors. So if you would like to know if another process out somewhere on the cluster crashes, you can be notified. You can ask the operating system, the Erlang VM, for this. And it'll tell you, and you have two options of doing this. You can create a link, which is like a death pact. You say, I, if, if you die, I'm going with you. And if I die, you're going with me too, by the way. So this is the Thelma and Louise. And so if we uh, have another option, it's less intense, and it's called monitors. And this is more like reading the obituaries. We want to know when you die. We care about that. But we don't want to go with you. And so built on these two primitives, uh, we have these things in the Erlang VM and OTP called supervision trees that let us recover from failure really easily. And if a group of things need to all fail, if something goes weird, like you call tech support and they say, uh, reboot your computer, and you do, and all the processes bounce and come back up and everything's healthy, well, that's where the idea of links come in. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at scheduling on the VM. We have a CPU core, and we have a single scheduler then. 
And so you can think of a program as a stream of operations. The Erlang VM scheduler gives each actor process a chance to run about 2,000, or run exactly 2,000 operations, and then immediately moves on to the next actor process, and it gets 2,000 and so on. And there's no way that any actor can be a hog. It can't take more than its 2,000. It immediately says preemptive scheduling, and there are no hogs, and the context switching is almost zero between these processes. So it's just buttery smooth, soft real-time processing that we get here. And we have two cores. We get two schedulers, and we go from concurrency to concurrency and parallelism here. We have two things actually running at once. And so on. On Waterpark, our one-use servers, they have 56 logical cores. And so in addition to our hundreds of thousands of processes running or millions of processes in that concurrency, we actually have 56 things truly running in parallel at any one moment. And this is all handled by this operating system. So hopefully that gives you an idea of why we went this route. And so now we can talk about healthcare. <laughs> so we wanted to have a digital twin of every patient. An actor process per patient, not a database row per patient. So typically in healthcare, a patient is represented as a moment in time snapshot of data. So rows, JSON, whatever, on disk typically. And so most systems, they read patient data, and they perform work based on these current values, and they flush their memory buffers like a goldfish, and then they move on to the next data without any idea of what just happened. Water Park, we model each patient actor as a long-running patient actor. So these patient actors, they represent or are dedicated to this one human, and they run from pre-admit to discharge for weeks sometimes. Well, actually, always, <laughs> always for weeks, and sometimes for months, uh, depending on if we have a really sick patient. With, uh, the patient actor will be running for a long, long time. So a patient actor is not limited to the data of the latest HL7. It holds every HL7 message in the events that led to that current state. And so this could be thousands and thousands of messages. There's an idea in healthcare called the long shift. And so you all probably know nurses and doctors. And so nurses, they often work these 12-hour shifts, and it's to provide continuity of care to patients and to reduce the frequency of dangerous handoffs. And this statement from uh, the Joint Commission is kind of the why of this, why caregivers work long shifts. Because 80% of medical errors happen in the handoffs in the transitioning of care. The things, the tacit knowledge that wasn't passed along, that wasn't charted. And so it's dangerous, these handoffs, and so as a result, this whole industry, people work longer hours just to have one less of those a day. So patient actors, we extend this long shift idea to provide continuity of care for our clinical systems. So we're not gonna be goldfish that's gonna have a transition every, every message. We're gonna, we're gonna have continuity of care across the actor. It gives us better context and awareness of the full patient visit. So this awareness enables real-time notifications and alerts based on days or weeks of events, transfers, drugs administered, lab results, procedures, and so on. So let's have a little bit of a, of a visualization of this. And so we have here in a facility, we have two patients. And we receive patients as HL7 messages. And we'll take a peek at that, what those look like in a bit. Um, and as these HL7 messages come in, they have information about what patient's tied in there. And so when they hit water park, we spin up a patient actor if we don't have one for that patient. So that actor it spins up on the cluster somewhere, and we store that admit. We process it, we do whatever we're going to do with it, and, but we store the message also. And then another message comes in for that same patient. It accumulates. This other patient, we spin up that actor, and so on. And so we see this transcript building up off of these messages. These maybe are days apart, these messages. So HL7, I told you we'd see it. <laughs> so there it is. This is a tiny little HL7 message. You can find this one on Wikipedia. There's an article. To make it slightly easier to read, I've bolded the segment headers and put some space in there. But we can walk through this thing, and there's, uh, we use this HL7, this path syntax of MSH is the segment, and then three is the field within that. See the sending app, sending facility, receiving app, receiving facility the date that the message came in, uh, was created. The message type here, we have an admit, an ADT, uh, admit discharge transfer, and A01 is an admit message. And then we have a message ID and an HL7 version. And so I had never seen HL7 when I began this research. I'd heard of it, I knew it was important, but I'd never actually seen an HL7 message, and pretty quickly it became the most important thing in my day. And so early on, uh, we knew it was critically important to be able to deal with this in water parks, so we built an HL7 library. And I'm really proud that HCA took that work and shared it with the community. So 
raising all boats, caring for the community. Yay, open source. And then we have this one more good reason then for healthcare companies to use Elixir. And so, and you can trust this thing works because it is right now off in data centers all over. It is chunking through lots and lots of HL7. It has been for a good long while, years. Okay, so let's see what this thing, let's kick the tires on this library. So we'll say a message HL7 new and we'll give it some text that HL7 we're just looking at. And so we get this thing and then we can do things like querying against it. We can say query get part AL13.2 and pop, we get aspirin back. And so that shows you kind of what it looks like. You can pull this down, play with it. And one thing that we use on top of that is scalable bloom filters. And so we'll see these segments of the papers we love. We, 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 we read a lot and we bring a lot of research and we bring things in. And so scalable bloom filters is one of those things. So how can we apply this to HL7? So we have this probabilistic data structure that has two things on it. It lets you add an item and it lets you uh, see if you've added that item in the past. Has it already been added? And so this probabilistic data structure doesn't store objects, and it doesn't even store hashes. It does a really memory efficient thing, and we can, you can dig into the, from the paper or from this book here. Probabilistic data structures is really an awesome book. Um, and then, but we have these guarantees. We're gonna get no false negatives. If we've, uh, we won't get a no if we've really put something into the Bloom filter, but we will get false positives. And the scalable Bloom filter lets us modify how much uh, false positive uh, uh, we can tolerate. So we say 1%. And the scalable bloom filter will then say, as you add more and more items, it'll just make the bloom filter slightly bigger as you add more and more items. And it'll maintain that 1% false positive rate. So what would that look like against an actor? So we could say as patient 1000 uh, bloom filter, we're gonna add that aspirin that we just searched for a minute ago. And we're gonna add it in a special way. We're gonna create a string here, AL1 3.2 colon aspirin. We're gonna put the whole path and the value there. We're gonna add that to the bloom filter. We're gonna add this diagnosis of uh, unspecified chest pain. And then we're gonna add the zip code for this patient. And we could add all sorts of paths through this message. We could go through them all. Or we could just add the words to get full text indexing, what we have on the right. And so that's really cool. And so we can then walk across this patient and we can walk across all the patients actually against say an ETS table or something that would have all of the patients in their bloom filters. And it wouldn't even disturb the actors to do this. Uh, but we can hit these bloom filters and we can say, PID7, do you have this date of birth? Pop, yes, I have that. Birmingham, yeah, I have that. So this wasn't a path, this is just free text <clears throat> because we'd index that way. And then is member, and we ask COVID-19, it says false. Because when we were doing this work, there was no such thing as COVID-19, didn't exist. And so all of a sudden, those research tools, which were very good and handy, those took a backseat to this other goal here of in three weeks, we need to take water park to production. And so, which also meant in three weeks, you never get to take anything down. This thing always has to run forever and ever from this point forward. And so good thing, we've been thinking about continuous availability from the beginning and we had our uh, things lined up. And so this means no unplanned outages and no planned outages. And to get there, we followed this idea from the Erlang VM that's really big in that community, in the Erlang community of no masters. So here we have a task. Uh, so this is, a, this is not a good one, by the way. This is not a good pattern that we're looking at here. We have a task router with three worker nodes. Problem, we have a master up there. If it fails, then the workers aren't gonna be doing anything. Here, we have another bad plan. Worker node, worker node, worker node, shared storage. Fails, we have a master, you're down. <clears throat> so let's look at Two, well, let's look at this. This is, we have roles and series. So web, business logic, and database. And you might have heard this called, say, the interior architecture. And also called the worst high availability plan ever. So if any of these things fail, your full system is down because this problem. So given a component that's three nines of availability, we get 8.8 .8 hours of downtime a year. That's 8.8 .8 hours too many for us. And so if you have in series on the left, versus parallel on the right, you get two different results. You get 28 hours or 20, 27, 26 hours of downtime a year, or you get 32 milliseconds. If you can hit any of these three, if any of them are down, you're okay. So we like the option of three and in, in parallel rather than series. And what we liked even more than that was eight. And we liked more than that, we liked to divide those into four and four into availability zones at the data centers so that if the power failed at half of the data center, our servers on that side of the data center wouldn't, uh, on the other side, wouldn't go down. 
And so it's completely separate networks, completely different power systems. And so we piggybacked on that and had separation within the data centers so that we could uh, use as much of the physical separation and the, and the availability zones there. Okay. And we did that at Florida, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. Okay, let's talk about process pairs. So process pairs was the technique used by Jim Gray in the design of the fault tolerant tandem computer. And yeah, <laughs> and but this uh, ends up being one of the seed ideas in Erlang as they were building Erlang out, uh, and and so this is one that, that Joe uh, cited, and he uh, and he talks about earlier. But there's a paper by Joe Armstrong, uh, uh, father of Erlang here, and basically saying that to be fault tolerant, you really need to nodes have to be able to detect if another node's failing, it is crashed. And remember that links and monitors bit? Well, that's where this comes in. This is one of the ways that comes in. And they should have sufficient data to take over for a down node, and users should not even notice the failure. So how do we do that on Waterpark? So we have this patient 1001, and it's up here, and it's running in Florida A2. <clears throat> We're also going to have a read replica of that patient running up on Florida. And it's going to have all the data, and it'll take read requests, and the writer will take the write requests, but there, it's going to be there in case something happens. We also have a read replica in Tennessee and Texas and at Utah. And we do this for two reasons. One, this lets us survive data center failures, multiple servers across multiple data centers. We can, we can be without losing any data or any availability. And uh, it also gives us the CDN quality, a content delivery network. So if someone is doing lots of querying down in Utah, they don't have to actually reach out to Florida to pull the data uh, for those patients that are there. They have a full copy of it locally. And so if that server A2 crashes there, we get a signal about that, and we just spin up a new writer there. But how do we know where that writer goes? How do we know where any of these readers go? How do we know where any of this stuff lives? And so we use server hash rings. So we're going to new up a hash ring, and we're going to add a bunch of servers to it. We got that. And then we can say key to node, actor key 1001. And actor key 1000 node, given this hash ring, will always map there. Every single request, it's, it's always going to go there. Okay. We use a particular hash ring uh, that implements rendezvous hashing. And so here's a paper about that you can go dig in and look at. But Rendezvous hashing gives us this quality, which keeps churn from happening. So given an actor key 1001, each zone assigned a key to a score. And so the server scoring the highest will own that key. So here we are in S7. And even when other servers drop, well, it's still the highest scoring because nothing changed there, right? And so that, that process, that actor, stays on that server. It doesn't have to move around, reduces a lot of churn. Now, the things that were on S2 and S3, they have to move because there's no, more, there's no longer a server there. But all these other things get to stay there, and it re reduces the amount of churn that we have on the cluster. Okay, our topology. Let's take a peek at that. So we get our DCs, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Florida. Topology, get DC ring of Tennessee, and we get that. We can say, get the current topology. Let's get the whole topology here. Okay. And if we say uh, actor server ID, and we give it this facility and this ID, well, the hospital X helps us map that to Tennessee. We're like, oh, that's one of those. And that gives us that hash ring, and we're able to come up with Tennessee B2. So we wanted this consistent global process registry, but that was far too expensive. The idea of having consensus on millions and millions of things that are changing all the time, not going to happen. So our solution was math. So what we had to do is we just needed to maintain consensus on topology. And we used that then to route to the proper local registries, which are fast and cheap and easy to maintain. And so then we didn't need a global registry. But we still had to do consensus not on millions of things, but just on one thing and a tiny thing. But it's still not free and not necessarily easy. So this paper here, Heidi Howard, this, uh, Distributed Consensus Revised, um, points this. Paxos is widely deployed in
And so when we had a similar story with RAP, we, wow. we had RAP libraries we tried to use, and we, we couldn't use RAP because it would basically make our system unavailable and it's not sure it's not there. Thank you. And so this, this is a really useful problem for us. Thank you, love. We had uh, okay.
We just push. Ah. <laughs> and we just push uh, the, then the config, and it updates the, uh, the server at that point. Okay? And so that, that latent feature then goes into operation in prod. Okay? This idea I absolutely love, and Joe here described this as his favorite Erlang program. And so the idea here is you have a patient, or you have a, no, he didn't have a patient actor. He didn't, he didn't write healthcare. He wrote telecom. Uh, and so you had an actor running, and you could say, hey, actor, I'm going to send you a message, and I want you, based on the message, to become different things. And so you tell that actor, I'm going to give you the instructions how, on how to become an HTTP server or how to become an FTP server, and then that actor would become that. And so this idea really played into Waterpark. This is what we did in those three weeks. <laughs> Whenever we were told we were about to go to prod, this is what we knew we had to get in place to support use cases. And so uh, COVID hit. We went to production. We knew we needed a way to turn the patient actor into a universal server that could be extended and changed dynamically at runtime with no downtime. And so here, let's look at our infinite stream of stuff coming through and going into our, being processed by our patient actor. And then let's look at this collection of our event handler plugins, our universal server extensions that hook on here. Okay, each one of those, they have an interface where, uh, like we said earlier in the, in the invariants, is they have projections, they take messages, they have the event store, and they return new projections back. So much of this talk so far has been, it's been about the how. And here we're going to talk just a, a bit about the why it matters. And so early in the pandemic, we deployed a patient actor plugin, one of these universal server plugins, to immediately notify facility caseworkers any time a patient who had transferred from a nursing home or from a long-term care facility tested positive for COVID. So this allowed early contact tracing at those facilities and quarantines to reduce the virus spread within these extremely vulnerable communities. So let's look at our simplified rules of this uh, plugin that went out. So was the admission source a nursing home or long-term care facility? Is this a COVID-19 lab order? Do we have a result? Is the result positive? Have we notified a case manager already? And so this is a checklist. And so we're going to walk through here uh, with, with this checklist. And as each message comes in doing this, at the point that we get all of our checks checked, we know it's then time to act. And so this model, based really kind of off the ideas of Atul Gawande in his Checklist Manifesto book, uh, here we, we have this set of things, this checklist, and we know we're going to then do something when this happens. And this also becomes a really nice place to build property-based tests. Um, so these are pure functions. Each one of these becomes a, anyway. So, uh, and at this point, we generate this LTCF alert, comes down, is delivered, and the case manager, we're going to note that they're informed so that we don't keep on annoying them, telling them the same thing has happened. They've already contacted the, uh, the facility. Things are already going to happen now. And so my friend and hero, Joe Armstrong. So he passed away in 2019. And um, about a year and a half later, these ideas, you know, they came in. And for, you know, from beyond the grave, this guy is out there making nursing homes safer than they would have been otherwise. So here'd be the takeaways. Absorb papers and conference talks. Keep ideas in your head. And, uh, and, and every time you see new technologies, new ways of applying it, you'll be prepared then in ways you wouldn't have been otherwise. <clears throat> and um, you know, find and create work that's meaningful out there. It's, um, it's, it's easy to spend a career doing work that doesn't choke you up. <laughs> so, so thanks. And a special thanks to my team back at HCA. Uh, the, the developers, the team, the whole crew that I work with, they're just absolutely brilliant. And working with them has been the most fun, meaningful work of my career. So big hats off to them. And so we maybe have a couple of minutes for questions. And uh, one other thought, if, if this stuff is appealing to you, 
and you'd like to be uh, colleague 275,000 plus one, uh, uh, you know, send me an email or, or hit me on Twitter and follow up with me because uh, we're always growing and those other research projects that we were talking about, those have spun off and we have all sorts of interesting things outside of water park going on. And so uh, this is a really nice ground to do good, good work. So thanks. So the question was about, as you have multiple versions of the VM, this is a tricky thing to, to manage because your world, you have different worlds out there at the same time. And so we have to do this 3D chess game of, uh, of thinking about, on our cluster at any moment, how many versions of the software. So not just versions of Erlang, but even our code. If we change things, we have a heterogeneous cluster. And all these, mess these actors are sending messages back and forth to each other all the time. And so if we do something, we could brick brick it really hard. And so, so we do lots of testing. We do things with Jepson. We do things where we actually spin up Docker clusters where we run multiple versions of the software at the same time. All these things automated tools that support that. And so you'll want to do that. And so we went through, I think, three. We went from 22 to 23 to 24. So we've upgraded Erlang three times, major versions. Uh, we've had these hundreds of bounces. Uh, we've actually had servers RAM catch on fire. And you know, we've had all sorts of problems out there. And uh, we've kept on churning. So, uh, and I know we wouldn't have done that on a different stack. Uh, I've, uh, in background is, uh, uh, for years I was in the Microsoft stack, MVP, uh, F sharp, C sharp, and using the tools I was using back then, this wouldn't have happened. And so, uh, uh, any other question? Well, actually, we're right at time, and so I will not uh, ask. You can hit the questions on Slack or hit me on Twitter and so on. But thank you all. <laughs>